York, second city of England in medieval times. Daily life is hard enough without the ever-present shadow that stalks all members of society, from kings to beggars. Centuries before the discovery of penicillin, people go about their lives knowing that only church or meagre charity will be their help if they fall prey to the spectre of disease. For more than 700 years, a woman lay buried below the old stone streets of York. There was no record of who she was, nor of the awful condition she had to endure without hope of a cure. You accepted death was going to be with you soon. Now new research is unlocking the story of her life by uncovering the evidence contained in her bones. It could be the proto-NHS, but a long, long time ago. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. A team of archaeologists investigates medieval life by exploring the world of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. In our stores, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You're looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? I forbid you ever to enter a church, a monastery, a fair, a mill, a market, or an assembly of people. I forbid you to leave your house unless dressed in your recognizable garb and also shod. I forbid you to share house with any woman but your wife. I command you, if accosted by anyone while travelling on a road, to set yourself downwind of them before you answer. I forbid you to enter any narrow passage, lest a passerby bump into you. I forbid you, wherever you go, to touch the rim or the rope of a well without donning your gloves. I forbid you to touch any child or give them anything. I forbid you to drink or eat from any vessel but your own. The words of the mass of separation, thought by some to have been spoken by medieval churchmen to sufferers of leprosy. In the middle of the Middle Ages, around the 10th to 11th century, the medieval world rises. As the Dark Ages are gradually left behind, the rate of change within societies gathers momentum. Across Europe and the Near East, societies experience huge change. Birth rates increase and populations grow. Migration between countries increases and within countries, migration from the land to urban areas. Towns and cities grow to accommodate vast new populations. And more people brings more problems, such as overcrowding, poverty, war. As if the everyday folk of the medieval world didn't have enough hazards to contemplate, it's a time of expansion too for mankind's greatest enemy, disease. It's an age still several centuries before the discovery of bacteria and penicillin. In cramped towns and remote rural areas alike, sanitation and hygiene were misunderstood or completely absent. The 15th century Dutch cleric Erasmus knew how filthy were the houses of most people. 
Floors are laid with white clay and are covered with rushes, occasionally renewed, but so imperfectly that the bottom layer is left undisturbed, sometimes for 20 years, harboring expectoration, vomiting, the leakage of dogs and men, ale droppings, scraps of fish, and other abominations not fit to be mentioned. Conditions were perfect for bacteria and the spread of infection. Disease had no equal in the misery it could inflict. There were no defences against it, no inoculations, no cures. By our standards today, it's inconceivable the people of medieval England endured such living conditions. Did they have a really pleasant life, live a life of luxury, eat the right foods, have a really pleasant, you know, rich lifestyle? Or did they suffer some of the most horrendous diseases known to man, leprosy, syphilis, things that really affected them and even took their, the evidence with them to the grave? And so looking at the skeleton, you can see them and say, that was not a nice way to live or to die. Archaeologists now recognize that much can be learned from the study of disease. Its effects are locked away in the archaeological record, in the skeletal remains of the population of the Middle Ages, the medieval dead. Charlotte Roberts has spent her career studying archaeological human remains through the lens of biological research. She's a bioarchaeologist. I think the term bioarchaeologist melds the two disciplines of biology, so looking at the biological evidence for disease, with the archaeological context. I need to understand the archaeology of the site from which these skeletons come from to be able to interpret the evidence for disease that I see in the skeletons. Charlotte is an expert in paleopathology, the study of diseases within the archaeological record tracing their history and development. It's a relatively new discipline, having grown primarily over the past 50 years. But now recently it's been helped by developments in new methods, such as DNA analysis of the pathogens that cause infectious disease. It's a branch of archaeology which has the potential to influence current or future healthcare. Can we, as paleopathologists, actually study those diseases and help explain, inform what we see today and perhaps predict the future? We know, even just from historical documents in the past, that a lot of infectious diseases were pretty rife in the medieval period and a lot of that was to do with the type of living conditions people had, the types of diet they were eating or what, what diets they weren't eating. So these, these people are from late medieval York, buried at uh, a site called Fishergate House, um, about 200 of them. And a lot of them were non -ad we would call non-adults, so they're not adults in age. At the University of Durham, students learn how to spot evidence of disease. It's part of the skill of a bioarchaeologist detecting the traces of infection um, on skeletal remains. To be able to teach and research in paleopathology, you need to have skeletal remains or mummified remains to, to work with. In the medieval period, there seemed to be a, a huge range of infectious diseases many of which that we wouldn't actually be able to see on the skeleton because they only affect the soft tissues. But the key ones for me would be tuberculosis and leprosy, both caused by bacteria, as is something called treponemal disease. So those three, what I would call specific infections, were, were ones that co could cause damage to the skeleton and were pretty frequent in the medieval period. One of the most prevalent of these medieval diseases was syphilis, still known today as a venereal condition. Archaeologist and paleopathologist Don Brothwell has studied ancient diseases in human and animal remains for almost half a century. That, that is suspicious, as if it could be surgical. 
<laughs> First of all, you've got to realise that there are three clinical diseases, uh, and venereal syphilis is just one of them. And that probably, if you're thinking in terms of an evolutionary tree of diseases, um, that is close to the other two, but in fact probably is the last evolving venereal syphilis from this other group called the treponemes, or treponematosis, the whole group is called. And the other two are endemic syphilis and yours. Endemic syphilis, you, you pick it up, usually d during the first 10 years of your life. It's linked with um, poor hygiene, sharing food vessels and that sort of thing. So it, it's within family groups, you're, you're all together eating, sharing, food utensils and so on. So this is where it all begins. So it, it's easily caught during childhood and then it gradually progresses through into the adult period. Now endemic syphilis was probably um, affected a lot of the populations during medieval times in the Near East. Now our connection there of course with, with, with the Crusades for instance. So we're likely to have probably picked up endemic syphilis and brought it through into northern Europe. I think at that stage probably well-defined venereal syphilis, sexually transmitted syphilis, probably wasn't around or was extremely uncommon. Through his work in paleopathology, Don believes that syphilis underwent a fundamental change, identified through remains in the archaeological record. The transformation happened within the medieval period, at the height of the great population changes then occurring. But what I think was happening during the medieval period was that in fact the disease endemic syphilis was becoming transformed and it was becoming transformed because it had to move through into northern Europe into different societies in colder climates and so on. So the medieval world was very interesting from this point of view for the evolution of venereal syphilis, I think. This is really quite an interesting phenomenon that was going on during the medieval period. We know diseases have changed. They change their face through the years, modifying themselves and so on. I mean, Darwin would have been excited by this and he didn't know about it at the time. We don't know how many times it's changed. This is something which we still really have to study. We can study the evolution of man, but in relation to that, there's also the evolution of the diseases which were following him through time, as it were. The work of paleopathologists is being aided as more skeletal remains become available for study. Less stigma is attached now than in previous eras to excavating Christian burials from the medieval period and even later. Now in terms of numbers of bones or skeletons, let's just take uh, England or Britain. Now we're excavating more Christian burial grounds and that's why they're beginning to turn up in more numbers. So we, ha we have now quite a few cemeteries, either earlier medieval or later medieval. One of the most notorious diseases of the medieval period still carries with it today the stigma of uncleanliness and decay. It was a terrible condition to endure in medieval times, though it was, and still is, one made worse for sufferers by the plethora of myths, superstitions and inaccuracies which surround it. The Bible did nothing to alleviate this. One myth about leprosy is that it's described in the Bible and unfortunately, that myth has led to the continued stigmatization of people with leprosy today. But it, it is believed now that, that the word in the Bible that people have used as indicating leprosy was a mistranslation of a Hebrew word, which basically means uh, skin diseases, impurity, but not leprosy specifically. Misrepresentations like this I mean, leprosy is still generally regarded as being incurable. Another myth is that leprosy is incurable. 
but it is curable with antibiotics. And in fact, the treatment's been free since 1995. So if people can get access to the treatment, then they can be cured. So leprosy is curable, but people call it the living death. By modern standards, it's a serious but curable infection. Leprosy is a bacterial infection, so caused by bacteria. The bacteria ends up in the lungs, usually from someone with leprosy coughing and sneezing over someone else, and then they inhale the droplets containing the bacteria. So it establishes itself in the lungs, um, and then potentially it will spread um, to other parts of the body. The bacteria affects the bones of the face, mainly the architecture of the nasal area. It can also affect the nervous system, the sensory nerves, motor nerves, and the autonomic nervous system. Sufferers lose their sense of feeling, leading to damage to the fingers and toes going unnoticed and becoming ulcerated and infected, which can then spread to the bones. Another crude myth dogs leprosy sufferers, that they lose fingers and toes. Again, it's a misrepresentation of the disease's symptoms. When the infection affecting the hands and feet, or the hand and foot bones, gets established, the fingers and toes are affected and they tend to absorb. So the ends of the fingers and toes absorb and the fingers and toes get shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, but the skin contracts around what's left of the fingers and toes and the actual nails, the fingernails and toe nails, are actually retained. So, so they don't drop off. The toes and fingers just get shorter. So to be able to uh, recognize leprosy in skeletons, we're looking for those facial changes and we're looking for changes in the hands and the feet. Probably the greatest myth surrounding leprosy is that it causes fatality. In fact, it weakens the immune system, meaning death can occur from whatever other infections the individual is also exposed to, such as tuberculosis in medieval times. Yet leprosy sufferers were just as likely to die from everyday conditions such as heart attack or stroke, though they might have lived with the disease for decades beforehand. Leprosy is called a living death because you don't die from it and you can live for many years with it, but you can get complications that will eventually kill you, like kidney problems. Um, but I think the living death phrase attached to leprosy has perhaps come through history and I'm not entirely certain that that would have been the case for everyone in the medieval period, feeling that it was the living death. Is it possible that medieval people had a more pragmatic, accepting view of leprosy than up to now we've given them credit for? Our perceptions today of leprosy are influenced by 19th century attitudes, when sufferers were banished to remote places like condemned criminals, known as leper colonies. So when, when we come to the 19th century and the treatment of people with leprosy then, we see a lot of islands being used for segregation of people with leprosy. Robben Island off the south coast of, of South Africa was where people were sent with leprosy. Spinalonga, the island off the side of Crete in Greece, um, and Molokai in Hawaii. Documentary sources suggest their existence wasn't very pleasant, so you can imagine the sort of existence these people were having at that time. The 19th century was the time of mass transportation of criminals, as well as the sufferers of infectious disease. In the medieval period, this practice was still hundreds of years in the future. They had to deal with the problem of leprosy in society in different ways. Medical knowledge of disease 
was still in the realm of alchemy and superstition. If you went to a doctor in medieval period, they would have described the cause of illness as being due to an imbalance of your humours. At that time, the idea of health was based upon the four humours of blood, phlegm, black bile and yellow bile being in balance. And if they were out of balance, or if they were corrupted, then that led to illness. Piers Mitchell is a consultant doctor and bioarchaeologist. He studied the principles on which medieval medicine was taught and administered. Now, among the higher clergy, we have this concept that uh, sin may be a cause of illness. In the 13th century, for example, um, the Fourth Lateran Council specifically states that before a doctor should treat a sick patient, they should have abolition of their sins because certain diseases will not get better, regardless of how good a doctor is, unless God forgives the sins that caused it. Most people who fell ill in the medieval period would just be looked after by their family until they got better or died. Those who were wealthy, who could afford a physician, or in fact the nobles who would have employed a physician to look after them full time as such, these people would have had uh, medical intervention and treatment. And of course the physician would assess their humoral balance by looking at their urine, checking their pulse, and all the other ways they would interpret humoral balance. Around the 11th century, as the problem of leprosy grew in European cities, special hospitals began to appear. In the medieval period, we start to see the setting up of hospitals known as leprosaria, which was specifically for people they felt had leprosy. People with leprosy generally wanted to be in these leprosaria. They were felt to be a good place to be. They were looked after, they were fed and watered, they had a chaplain, and they could say prayers and prepare themselves for the next life. And they often saw having leprosy as a way of making penance for their sins so that they already had been cleansed of their sins so that they were in a better position to get into heaven. Leprosaria were places where, by relative standards, a genuine humanist approach was adopted, rather than being places to hide away unsightly or undesirable elements of society. Historians are now saying from documentary data that they were actually fairly pleasant places to be, because at least you got fed, and you got a roof over your head, somewhere to sleep, and it was probably better than living in a gutter uh, with no food and no shelter. They are often independent institutions set up by a rich nobleman or a businessman who would want to have a philanthropic way of spending their money, so everyone in town thought they were really nice. But also, it was a way of getting prayers said for their soul, so that when they died, if they were not able to go straight to heaven, there were people praying for them, so that they would then be able to proceed to go into heaven, to make up for the sins that they may have made during their life. And so we find from the 11th century onwards a rapid rise in the foundation not only of leprosaria for people with leprosy, but also of general hospitals and almshouses and any way that you were providing care for the poor or the needy where they would say prayers for your soul. Medieval leprosy hospitals were different to the later 19th century colonies. They were not places for people cast out from society in forbidden, remote places. They were more a part of society and their sighting reflected this. Leprous area were often in the midst of the new busy towns and cities. People talk about the sighting of leprosy hospitals outside city walls, but if you think about it, it was quite a logical place to put them because they were often on roadsides, at crossroads, by bridges, and it was a good place to get charity you know, to get people to give them money, to get them to give them food. Skeletal remains showing signs of leprosy are rare. The effects of the disease only manifest in the bones in a very small number of cases. Due to the way the disease affects particular parts of the skeleton, such as the bones of the face, 
they often don't survive well in the ground. In 2007, a skeleton was found following development work in Dixon Lane, York, in the Walmgate area within the medieval walls. The York Archaeological Trust excavated the site, believed to be the cemetery associated with the lost church of St. Stephen's. Osteoarchaeologist Marlin Holst was asked to carry out a full analysis of the skeleton and to confirm that the individual had suffered from leprosy. This um, skeleton here is from the medieval period, probably the high medieval period, so the 12th to 15th century. And she was found um, together with 116 other skeletons in um, the centre of York, not too far from Clifford's Tower. And um, it's a female skeleton, you can tell by this area here of the pelvis, which is very wide. And she was quite old, well, for medieval standards. She was at least 46 years old, but probably older. But unfortunately, because the aging of the skeleton relies on the deterioration of the joints, we can't age skeletons beyond the age of 46. So she could have been 93 years old or 47. Uh, so we can't, we can't tell. So the interesting thing with this skull, we've got some lesions that are associated with leprosy. So the area here of the nose um, is more eroded or is eroded, which normally wouldn't be the case. And that's typical of the so-called rhinomaxillary syndrome in uh, skeletons of individuals with leprosy. She also has lesions in the fingers that could be associated with leprosy. Um, you can see here, this is the first digit of the finger, this part here. And this bit is the middle digit here, so it's, it's this digit there. And you can see that this is normal in shape, but this part here is actually tapered at the distal end. And that's probably um, the result of leprosy, and it's the same in all of the central digits, or parts of the digits, in both hands. I think from looking at the skeleton, you can certainly say that she was cared for because she lived to a good age. She probably had the leprosy infection for some time. And normally, leprosy infection occurs during childhood or young adulthood. So the fact that she's at least 46 years old means that she's lived for some time with this infection. Now, what is interesting as well is that she's got very thick dental plaque on some of the teeth. You can get an awful lot of information from this material because basically everything that goes into your mouth can be trapped in this material. This is rock hard, this is very, very tough stuff. So it, it can literally trap anything. There can be evidence for smoking or for um, uh, what per people eat, for example, uh, raspberries and so on. Um, there can also be flower weevils, so all sorts of things can be trapped in these things and now we have the technology to analyse it. So this is very interesting stuff and the thicker the better. Also the person's DNA that can be trapped there. Research is now being done to broaden the understanding of leprosy and other infectious diseases in archaeology. Up to now, it's not always been possible to say for certain that an individual had leprosy, only if they had had it long enough for it to make recognisable changes on the surface of bones. Yet now, with new DNA techniques, it's becoming possible to unlock information preserved within skeletal remains. At the University of York's Department of Bioarchaeology, Sarah Fidiment and Camilla Speller are developing new techniques to do this. One involves sampling organic material from within one of the best preserved parts of the skeleton, the teeth. In particular, they're interested in the dental calculus, or plaque, that builds up through daily life. If it isn't brushed away, the calculus forms deposits as hard as enamel itself, which can last for thousands of years. So this is the skeleton from Dixon Lane. 
and it does have nice thick deposits of dental plant. Oh wow. wow. That's great. Yeah. No, that is a lot. Do you think yeah. it's thick enough? I think so. Definitely. We think so. <laughs> I think if we start with these and just yeah. how much we collect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's at right. least five with considerable amounts. Mm -hmm. Calculus is basically the best reservoir we have of um, the bacterial history of that person. So we have remains of any of the possible diseases caused by bacteria. The remains are basically mineralized and preserved perfectly. So we're managing to get really good information both from DNA and proteins. So it's, it's an invaluable source, really. It starts off as a biofilm on the teeth, so a thin layer um, covering the enamel. And as the bacteria grows and as time goes on, that um, what was a film will become mineralized. And that basically is what preserves all the bacteria in a perfect state. And layers just consecutively grow on top. If you don't clean your teeth, then it just accumulates layer after layer. And these have particularly good calculus. It seems a shame that the dentist comes along now and scrapes up all our red calculus. You know, we pay them so much to remove it. We hope to do two different analyses on it, or three. Um, we'd like to look at the protein um, components, so looking uh, both at the human proteins but also at the bacterial proteins. Um, we're we're going to do DNA analysis on it um, and, and amplify the bacterial DNA uh, of all the different bacterial species that are in there and hopefully we'll be catching um, the microbacterium that causes leprosy, so Mycobacterium leprae. And so we're looking uh, speci specifically at this skeleton to see if we can reconstruct the ancient genome of Mycobacterium leprae, so we can see what leprosy, the genetic makeup of leprosy in the past, and compare it to today. Yeah, We're just only discovering, really, what a rich reservoir calculus is for these bacteria. And so this is one of the first applications, is to look beyond oral bacteria and now look at other, maybe, systemic diseases. Once you combine that you know, with the archaeological context and also with other information that you can get from the skeleton, you can sort of piece together quite a full picture of somebody's life. Sarah and Camilla's research is ongoing, and just one means by which the long-term history of diseases can be explored and tracked through time. The same way human and other behaviours are contained within the archaeological record. Piers Mitchell too has studied the archaeological evidence for infectious disease, in particular through his work in the Middle East relating to the Crusades. He studied how one of the military orders of knights was dedicated to helping with the problem of leprosy in the disease-ridden Crusader states. The Order of St. Lazarus was a, a Latin European style monastic order that was actually set up in the early 12th century in the Middle East as a result of the Crusades. It started off as a medical order where people with leprosy would be looked after by healthy people who were often pilgrims who came out to the East and decided to settle. By the 1140s, the Order of St. Lazarus expanded, so it didn't just have this leprosaria outside Jerusalem. It set up one in Acre, and it set up a number of other leprosaria in Caesarea and so on, other places in the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the other Frankish states. We find them expanding so that the leprosaria that had been built in as independent institutions in Europe were then donated by people who couldn't really afford to run them anymore and given to the Order of St. Lazarus. So it was then their job to look after them. What we find is over time, when knights and crusaders either develop leprosy or develop leprosy in Europe but wanted to spend the rest of their life doing something uh, what they felt was really important, they could join the Order of St. Lazarus so that we find that by the 13th century, the Order of St. Lazarus has a significant military component where they fight with the army of the King of Jerusalem. And the Knights of the Order of St. Lazarus would fight in their own component as part of the King's army. But they do tend to have had a reputation of rarely coming back. So while it may be that they deliberately wanted to fight to the death because they felt if you're going to die fighting the enemies of Christendom, then that may well have meant that you would then go straight to heaven from their, their views on, on what happened after death. But a number of battles in the 1240s and 1250s, we find that 
either all the members of the Aldous and Lazarus that took part died, or only a few returned alive. Within decades, the Order's influence extended from the Holy Land in the East to England. In England, there were about perhaps 320 leprosaria built altogether during the medieval period, and only eight of them were part of the Order of St. Lazarus. So you can see how the majority of leprosaria were still independent institutions paid for and run by towns or by the nobility. So far as is known, the Order of St. Lazarus operated no hospitals in the city of York, yet Charlotte Roberts believes the woman from Dixon Lane could still have received treatment in the city. She's come to the University of York's Department of Archaeology at King's Manor. Her aim is to find out what she can about medieval York's leprosy hospitals and whether there's a link between any of them and the Dixon Lane burial site. Marlin Holst knows the city's archaeological sites. She's carried out osteological analysis on many of the skeletons from them. I, I did a little bit of research trying to find out how many leprosaria there were in York yeah. in the medieval period. There was quite an early one in the 12th century, St Nicholas. Right, yeah. I think you found that one, haven't Yes, you? Yeah. that was excavated by the York Archaeological Trust. The records that remain seem to indicate that the city's leprosaria were places where people in need, who did not necessarily have leprosy, could also receive shelter. I noticed in the documentary evidence for this hospital that both people with leprosy and also the poor were admitted to this hospital. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so, it, was um, so it was a big mix. So the Dixon Lane skeleton was part of the St. Stephen's um, Cemetery skeletal assemblage, which was excavated here in this area, which was right next to the um, King's Fish Pool here. And I think that was. Um, excavated together with 113 other skeletons, again, none of which had leprosy, mm. so. Um, it's that common then that they had well, a marginal position? Well, uh, well, it's been suggested that they had a marginal position, but my research also suggests that generally, skeletons with leprosy from archaeological sites, and this is all over the world that I've located, are not, usually not in leprous area, and if they are in just normal parish cemeteries, um, they're not marginalised. Oh, right. they're, they're within, well, with everyone else. Yeah. So they're not made special. She was just amongst, right amongst all well, the other yeah. skeletons. Yeah. yeah. If the skeleton was buried in a marginal position, this could indicate an association with leprosy, that the burial was deliberately placed away from other graves. The next step is to try and locate the church where the Dixon Lane woman might have been a parishioner. But the area has changed dramatically with modern development. Looking at the medieval layout of that area might offer up clues. Helen Goodchild helps Charlotte try to zero in on the archaeology around Dixon Lane, where the lost church of St Stephen's is thought to have once stood. Is, I mean, is there any evidence on, on early maps, perhaps, of this St Stephen's Church? So in what period are we talking We're about? We're talking about the 13th, 13th 12th, century. 13th, 14th century. I'd say, well, the earliest map that we do have for York, or that actually shows any kind of real detail for the, for the city itself, is the John Speed map, which is actually much later, but mm. it's about 1610. So uh, this is just the modern Ordnance Survey map to its correct geographic coordinates. So if I turn that on um, here and switch off oh the wow. Ordnance Survey map. So Clifford's Tower is here. So in the, the whole castle precinct is here. Yeah. Um, so just to the east of that is what is probably the area of Dixon Lane. Yeah. The map doesn't show a connection with St Stephen's, but there are several other churches within a very close area, several of which have connections with leprosy. St Mary, St Margaret's, St Dennis and St George's, all are very, very near to each other. There's a number of saints actually associated with leprosy and the foundation of leprosaria. Uh, George is one of them, but also Giles, Mary Magdalene. There's probably a dozen 
saints associated with leprosy. Yeah, it is interesting that St George's Church is actually located very close to where we think St Stephen's was and where this lady with leprosy was buried. Mm. But what that tells us. Disease was almost impossible to avoid for everyday people in the Middle Ages. So much so that this influenced attitudes towards life and death. Now, infectious diseases in the medieval period were clearly feared. We hear of people that ran away from epidemics, so we know that they wanted to live. They didn't all want to die. But we do also know that attitudes to disease in the medieval period were fairly tolerant of death. They understood that death happened. They didn't all expect to live to a ripe old age. Until relatively recent times, the last 100 or two years, you, your life expectancy was low. So around earlier populations, medieval and prehistoric and so on, they were seeing people dead and gone, their parents, you know, by 30, 40 years of age. And, and that we can't understand nowadays. We can't really get a feel for that. that. That life was short for them all. They didn't see many old folk around, old in the sense of, you know, 80, 90, 100 years of age. A few would, you know, d make it, but very few. I think we don't realise how much people of those days were, you know, accepted. Life was short and tough if you got a serious condition. You accepted death was going to be with you soon. The church encouraged a fatalistic, yet essentially positive view as to how to live life, knowing that death was never very far away. The teachings from the church told them that if they did die, so long as they had confessed their sins and lived a good life, it didn't matter that they were going to die because they were going to go to heaven. And in that context, the fear of death was something that we would expect would be very different in the medieval period and much less of a problem than we might expect to find in modern people who may not follow a particular religion and who often fear death as a result because they think the end of their life is the end of everything for them. On the streets of York, Charlotte finds the spot in Dixon Lane where the woman lay buried for more than 700 years. All right, so this is Dixon Lane where the St Stephen's Church was and where the cemetery was excavated, obviously in advance of these new buildings here. And it's where the, the lady with leprosy was found. Um, whether there was actually any hospital nearby where this person had access to treatment is another matter. But uh, she was buried in the normal parish cemetery. Um, but she had bone changes of leprosy. Whether the, she'd actually been diagnosed with leprosy is another matter. Um, but it suggest, I, I would suggest that um, she was probably accepted in the community um, as part of that community and was buried in their community churchyard. Perhaps she was a valued member of the community even though she may have been recognised as having this, this infectious disease. It will never be known if the woman buried at Dixon Lane received special care for her leprosy. Yet where she lay was in consecrated ground, in the heart of a city parish, within a short walk of a church whose patron saint was connected with sufferers from that terrible disease. Hers was no exile's burial. She lay at the heart of a community that seems likely to have regarded her plight, at the very least, with compassion. She suffered from one of the worst diseases in human history, and yet she wasn't sent away to die in a closed colony. She was buried in the heart of the society in which she lived, and of which she was a part. To some degree, they are still here because we still have access to them. Sometimes when they develop a cemetery and they have to clear it, the people have to come up. Uh, and as, or as distasteful as some people might find it, sometimes it's a necessity. Sometimes these, are, these people are found by accident, the skeletons. And we have to do them a service by allowing them to tell us their story.
And so finding the evidence of these people brings it all back to life. It brings the evidence back straight towards us and it becomes unavoidable. So therefore we've got the buildings, we've got the people, we've got everything. And this is the medieval world. And it's a privilege to be able to study it.